We are going to be talking about these last days. We will be talking about a very relevant topic, a topic that uh, we talk a lot about. I guess if I was to ask for a show of hands, how many people believe we're living in the last days? Very likely most hands will go up, even if I don't ask you to do so. Yeah, some people will put two hands up. Studying prophecy and the events of the end of time is a topic of interest to a lot of people, especially, I would say, people who look at the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. We like to think that we are people of prophecy. We study the prophecies and you get an end, uh, sorry, you get a, a clear sense of the end of time when you look at the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And I know that uh, we have a great interest in the end of time, time of the end, the closing events of Earth's history, based on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And this uh, is evidenced and exhibited in the various charts and timelines that exist, that delineate the chronological events that will happen in the closing scenes of this earth's history, right? We have very specific definitions and understanding, precise distinctions between the end of time and the time of the end. Isn't that right? And we have charts and chronologies. How many of you like timelines and charts about closing events of earth's history? Okay, I've seen my fair share of charts. And look, they don't all match up, right? Today, I'm not going to resolve that dilemma for you. Today, we will be looking at the last days, but from a very different perspective. We're going to be looking at it, not from the perspective of the prophetic books, but from the perspective of the gospel. So, I would like you to put your seat belts on, your metaphorical spiritual seat belts on, because we're going to look at some things that might be new to you, that might be startling to you, that might be exciting, that might be alarming, I don't know. But I'm very excited about it, and uh, hopefully you'll see why that is the case. And uh, if anything, I assure you, it will be most interesting because it has to do with the vi one vital topic that supersedes in importance all other topics in the scriptures. Hopefully you'll see what I mean as we go along. Here is a verse in the book of Hebrews that is rarely used to talk about the end time events. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Who is this verse talking about? Jesus and the sacrifice of Jesus. This verse tells us about the end of the world. Isn't that right? When did it happen? According to this verse, when Jesus appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. According to the apostle here, this event marked the end of the world. I'm not making it up. Right? The verse says it. Can you see that? If we even to put it on a chart, it would probably look like this. Here is the cross of Christ, the event that happened in history. And according to the apostle who wrote the epistle of the Hebrews, that event marked the end of the world. I know that puts a spanner in all the charts that you might be thinking of. We're not looking at the prophetic charts. We're looking at the timeline as far as the gospel is concerned. And there's a very significant reason for that. So, what does the end of the world mean? Well, simply put, the end of the world means the start of another. Isn't that right? If something ended, then that means the commencement of something else. Something is beginning. This event marks a very significant and important transition. So important, the apostle says, listen, this was the end of the world. When Christ appeared and died, that's the end of the world. Wow. What does that really mean? What does that talk about? Clearly, to date, according to this passage, the cross of Christ stands as the most important and significant event in the history of the world. It brought about the end of the world. Isn't that right? 
We don't usually consider this verse in the context of end time events, and yet it does talk about the end of the world and puts the cross of Christ right there. Like I said, if you think this is a strange chart as far as prophecy is concerned, this is the gospel chart, all right? We're putting that together. I like charts. I like putting things in a visual way because it helps me understand. You see, the book of Hebrews is all about this significant change that happened at the end of the world. When the cross of Christ occurred, or particularly the death of Christ on the cross. A change into something better. That is the theme of the whole book of Hebrews. This change into something better. So radical is this change that the apostle refers to that event as the end of the world. I don't think we've ever put the end of the world so far as in 2,000 years ago. Usually we talk about then the end of the world in the last 100, 200 years or so, depending on how you define things, the end of time, the time of the end. But the end of the world is something that we look forward to, to happen in the future. Isn't that right? According to the apostle, it happened 2,000 years ago. Have we missed something? Perhaps. That's what we want to find out today. So this is why this theme of the book of Hebrews is about this better thing that came. And this is how the book actually opens up. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. You see something significant here? Well, I highlighted it, okay, to help, to help you out. <laughs> Paul, in writing Hebrews, refers to the current time of his writing as what? These last days. How long ago was that? About 2,000 years ago. Hebrews was written not long after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Sometime there in the first century or so is when that book was written. Now, the interesting point here, because this difference of when the end of the world happened, Christ died, and then these last days is also described in the manner or uh, indicated in the manner that God speaks. There are two different ways, according to this verse, in which God spoke. Isn't that right? He spoke one way in the past, but in these last days, He's speaking in a different way. Can you see that? He spoke in times past to the Father's how? By the prophets. Up until the end of the world. And you know what I mean when I talk about that, right? At the crucifixion of Christ. And then in these last days, he is now speaking by his son or in his son. Question. Is one mode of... Oh, projector is dead. Is one mode of speaking better than the other? Yes. The answer is? Is Yes. God's mode of speaking changed. He used to speak to the fathers by the prophets. In these last days, He speaks to us in His Son. And what marked the transition and difference is this event called the end of the world. And as we said, one mode of speaking is better than the other. It's clearer than the other. It reveals God's intention and mind more clearly and more in a way that can be understood better. And we will see what we mean about that as well. So if we put that in our chart, and uh, this is what we find. The cross marked the end of the world when Christ was sacrificed to put away sin by the death of Himself, the sacrifice of Himself. And then Paul talks about, in these last days, how God is speaking is in His, in his Son. So from the cross... We have been living in these last days. <laughs> Biblical so far? so far? I don't want anyone to go from here thinking I made up a new chart. Okay? <laughs> We're looking at what the scripture has to reveal. So I'm glad, yeah, so far. I, I'm, I'm watching. Thank you. You're watching me. You make sure we, we, we get the information from the scripture, not just what I have to say about that. So. These last days are marked by this manner of speaking. This new world is very significant, brothers and sisters. This new world that follows the end of the previous and the commencement of the new one. 
called these last days, indicating that it is shorter and will pass by quicker. The impression you get from these last days is this will end soon. There is another end besides the end of the world that is actually coming. This shortness of time actually began with the cross. You realize that? According to the apostle who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. The shortness of time began with the cross of Christ. So this new world, this new phase, this new time on this chart is actually referred to in the book of Hebrews with a very specific name. You're familiar with it, but here it is. Hebrews 8.13 In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So what are we talking about? A new covenant that replaces the first one. Isn't that right? Another phase. And so the first one is called the old. And the reason why it's old is because there is a, a new one. When is it ready to vanish away? At the end of the world. Isn't that right? That's when the new began, when the old ended. So the old covenant ended at the end of the world when Christ died. And the new covenant is what's in place now in these last days, according to the book of Hebrews. And it's in this time, in this new covenant, that God actually communicates and speaks with us in His Son or by His Son. So if we were to put that on our chart, this is what it would look like. Quite simply and quite clearly. When he talks about the new, that means he made the first old. And that which is old passes away with the passing away of the previous world. The commencement of the new world marks the commencement of the new covenant. And that's referred to as these last days. So, there's an issue here I want to deal with quickly. And that has to do with the misunderstanding of the covenants. Some people believe that the new covenant is nothing new. That the new covenant is actually the renewed covenant. Have you heard that? I most certainly have. Is the new covenant a renewed covenant? Because some people say, well, you know, the, the covenant that God had at the beginning there, that was a good covenant. And what happened after the cross is that same covenant was just renewed. Well, I have news for you. Not according to the book of Hebrews. It's actually a new covenant. And we're going to look at that. Because, for example, we used to live in a house. We were renting, right? And uh, our rent uh, lease was uh, finishing. And so we had a visit from the agent. And the question was very simple. Are you going to renew the lease? And we had the option to renew the lease or leave. And so we chose to renew the lease because we didn't have anywhere to go at the time. So they brought the... For the the contract, the, the lease again, and we had to sign, and that covenant was renewed. Same terms, same conditions, same place of living, and it was renewed. And then there came a time when we did find a place to move. And so we moved to a new place, which was actually better. And now we had a new contract or a new covenant that we signed with different conditions, different price or cost. Different house, different neighborhood. It was a new covenant. Make sense? Easy, right? The Bible talks about the new covenant as just being that. It's a new covenant. It's not a renewed covenant. And that's evidence from the verse we just read when Paul says, when he speaks about the new covenant, he made the first old. And that which is old is ready to what? Pass away. There is no renewing of the old covenant. We're getting something brand new. And if you don't believe that, just look at the mode or manner of God speaking. He's actually not speaking in the same way that He did in the old. Because back then He spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But now in this new, in these last days, He's speaking in a different way. He's speaking in His Son. So, it's not a renewed covenant. And it's important to make that distinction. Because it's actually 
a better covenant. Now, there's one place in the Bible that talks about the covenants, and that's the prophecy in Jeremiah. That's the only place really in the Old Testament that refers to that uh, specifically. And this is what Paul is expounding on in Hebrews. In Jeremiah, it says the following, chapter 31 and verse 31 onward. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. In the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Very clearly from Jeremiah here, the new covenant is not a renewed covenant. You know why? Because he says, it is not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. It's a different one. You can't say it's a renewed covenant. He says, it's not like that one. It's different. And when that happens, he says, it will occur after those days. So two components here, very clear, we learn from Jeremiah's prophecy. And this is what the book of Hebrews really expands, about, uh, expands on. The two components are, the new covenant was still future as far as Jeremiah was concerned. Isn't that right? Are you sure about that? You know, it's interesting. When I ask that question and people answer, all those who said yes, they, they go quiet a little bit. It's like they're, they're not too sure anymore. <laughs> Especially if you ask that a bit confidently, they really doubt their answer. Are you sure about that? Yes. Yes, yes amen. We need to be sure, even if someone makes us doubt what we're saying. It says so right here. Jeremiah is talking about a new covenant in the days that will come. God's saying the days are coming when I will make this. He says it's after those days. It's future. And the other key point is the new covenant is unlike the old one. Is that right? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Good. That's the way. Because it says here, it's not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers. You see, the, the epistle to the Hebrews shows us that the time for that covenant has come. The end of the world occurred, and now we're living in these last days where now God is speaking in His Son, and that is referred to as the new covenant. The old one has waxed old and is passed away. Because the idea exists, there's another misunderstanding of the covenant, is that the new covenant is actually still in the future. As far as we're concerned. Have you heard that? I certainly have. And if you haven't, you very likely will. If you talk about this topic to anyone. And it's one of the ideas that circulate. That the new covenant, is, uh, covenant has not yet come. It is still to come in the future. Well, I have news for you. If you don't realize that it's here, you've missed it. Because the most important event, as far as the book of Hebrews is concerned, the death of Christ, which marked the end of the world, happened. And with the end of the world comes the end of that covenant and the end of that mode and manner of God communicating. Now he speaks in a new way. Can we see that? It's called these last days. So with the end of the world came the new world. And now we're living in the time of this new covenant. We're living after those days. That's what Jeremiah is referring to when he says, after those days. Which days? The days that the old covenant occupied until those days come to an end. And after those days, you're going to come into the next phase, which is these last days. You with me? Now, don't think of your prophecy charts that you, you might be familiar with and you know where all the markers and timelines are and end of days. That's not what I'm referring to because that will throw you off. We're talking about this chart here and what we're finding from the book of Hebrews. The other thing about this covenant is that it is a better covenant. You see, if it's a renewed covenant, it doesn't make it better. It just extends its duration. That's what a renewing of a lease or a covenant does. But the book of Hebrews indicates that the new covenant is actually a better, better covenant. And here it is. Hebrews 8, 6. But now... Hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So here's the thing, simple question. If the new covenant is the better covenant, what does that make the old covenant? A worse one. 
Right? Not as good. Maybe let's, let's soften it a bit, right? Not as good. However you want to put it, as far as Paul is concerned, as far as the author, the apostle here is concerned, the new covenant is a better one, which immediately tells you the previous one was inferior, not as good. It was worse. And now we're going to see what is better about this new covenant. So let's put this on our chart. This is the end of the world. We're living now in these last days. That's what Jeremiah referred to as the time of the new covenant. And this new covenant is not like the old one. It's actually a better covenant. And the evidence is, all, you, all, all the evidence you need to look for is, did that event happen or not? The greatest event in the history of the world to date. Yes, it happened. Did it make any difference in the world? Most certainly, as far as the epistle to the Hebrews is concerned. And this is what we're finding. This is where we'll we are building this particular chart. So, this new world, after the end of the world, these last days, has this better covenant. The key feature, one of the key features of the new covenant is often misunderstood, and therefore, what we have is not appreciated as it should be. Now, I don't want to get into the big debate of the covenants, because I know it is a big debate. I'm just trying to simplify it and illustrate it in a way that we can understand it. If you want to debate it, we can do that after, not now. But I know that there is a big debate about it. I'm just trying to make, keep it simple as far as the scripture reveals. One of the key components in this new covenant are the closing words of Jeremiah when he talked about the new covenant, which Paul quotes in Hebrews. And here is how he puts it. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. At the conclusion and the close of describing the new covenant, he says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. I want you to think about that for a minute. This is one of the key features of the new covenant. In that, it says, God will not remember sins and iniquities anymore. You ever thought about that? What does that really mean? Hopefully we'll find out today. What does that mean? Because listen, this is one of the key differences between the new and the old covenant. Because in the old covenant, there actually was a remembrance of sin. Let's read it just so we can make sure so we can see the distinction. Hebrews 10, 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. That was the old covenant. The old covenant had a continual, ongoing remembrance of sins embodied in the sacrifices. As it says right there. Isn't that right? Every time a sacrifice is offered, there is a remembrance and a recollection of sin. And the reason why that was happening is because those sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, was not able to take away sin. So what kept happening is the people kept sinning, they kept bringing a sacrifice and offering it, and every time they brought a sacrifice, there is a continual remembrance of sin. That's the old covenant. The new covenant is different. In the new covenant, there is no remembrance of sin. What does that mean? You seeing a difference? One is better. That's why it is actually strange for people to say that the new covenant is actually a renewing of the old covenant. Oh, no, no, no. You've missed something major when you say that. It's not a renewing. It's a radical change. Something changed about sin with the death of Christ in the new covenant. It has to do with the remembrance of sin. And so, very clearly we see here, the sins were remembered because they were not taken away. You see that? The evidence for that is the sacrifices that kept on being offered. It demonstrated that that did not take away sin. It kept saying, and so you had the, they went through this ritual, this ceremony every year to represent the putting away of sin. 
on the day of atonement. And then what happened the next day or the next week or the next month? They brought more sacrifices and off we go again. Start again the next year. An ongoing remembrance of, of sin. That was the old covenant. The people kept sinning. They kept bringing sacrifices. They kept asking for forgiveness. And this was an ongoing problem that was not resolved. Because guess what? That covenant through the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. There was something better coming. It happened at the end of the world. This new and better covenant accomplishes that. Now, we just read this in the verse earlier. But I want to read it again to highlight the contrast. And hopefully see something in a fresh perspective. Here is Hebrews 9.26 where we started. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared. To do what? To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's why the new covenant has what? No remembrance of sin. You know why? Because Jesus and his sacrifice put it away. Ponder that for a minute and just let it sink in. In the new covenant, there is no remembrance of sin. There is no recollection of sin. God says, I will not remember their sins anymore. It has been removed. It has been put away by the sacrifice of Christ. No wonder then the apostle indicates that this event marked the end of the world. That's important. And a new world began, a new covenant, in which now there is no remembrance of sin. And this is what we want to find out. That sin has been put away. Wow. You see, the life and the sacrifice of Christ, brothers and sisters, utterly and completely defeated sin and put it away. The Bible says that Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He accomplished that completely and utterly. And once his sacrifice, when it was accomplished, put away sin forever. And that marked the beginning of a brand new world. A world that I fear to many of us, we're still waiting to happen in the future when it's already Done. here. That's why we're told that the end of the world occurred when this event happened. You see, there is now a life that exists in which sin has been totally defeated and put away and has no more room and therefore no more remembrance. There is such a life that exists. Whose life is that? That's the life of the Son. By the way, that's a human life. Because Christ, the Son of God, came to be a man and he condemned sin in the flesh and it's in this life that there is no remembrance of sin and this life actually commenced to be shared and given after the death and resurrection of Christ and it marked the beginning of the new covenant and God says listen this covenant is going to be unlike the other one because in this one there's going to be no remembrance of sin I hope you're thinking about what that means In other words, the reason why God does not remember sin anymore is because there is a life in which there is no sin. A totally sin-free life. And so long as God looks at that life, He can recollect no sin because all He sees is perfect righteousness and no sin. Amen. Whose life is that? The Son of God. The incarnate Son of God. And that marks the new covenant. So what's the connection here? Here is the key. And this becomes very interesting. Luke 22 and verse 20. Jesus indicates what the new covenant really is. Likewise also, this is at the Last Supper. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Very interesting verse. According to Jesus here, the New Testament is where? In His blood. You know, one time I was reading this verse. I read this verse before. I'm sure many of you have. 
And it never stood out to me. And suddenly one day, these words stood out to me. In my blood. According to Jesus, the new covenant exists where? In his blood. And what does blood mean? Life. And what he was giving the disciples was a symbol to represent the reality of what he was meaning. In his life is where this covenant exists. This new covenant. You see, we tend to think of the new covenant as a contract, as maybe an agreement, as some exchange that God has with us. If you actually look at the Bible, you will find that the new covenant is the Son of God Himself. And if there is any agreement, it's between God and His Son. As far as the terms of the plan of salvation is concerned. And His Son is the covenant. He's the embodiment of the covenant in which sin has been resolved, defeated, and utterly put away. And this is what Christ is proposing to give to His disciples. He says, listen, drink this cup because this is actually my life. And that's where the New Testament is. Because the life of Christ is not separate from Christ. So if the covenant is in His life, it's because He Himself is the covenant. We don't think of the new covenant as a person. I know that. But why don't we? That's how it's presented by Christ himself. Am I making this up? No. He said it's in his blood, not me. This is not my spin on it. This is not my take on it. This is his own words. And so, brothers and sisters, the new covenant is not a contract that God has with us. It's the plan of salvation between the Father and the Son. And the Son fulfilled it. And when we receive the Son, we become beneficiaries of that covenant. We receive the covenant. We have no contribution to make to the covenant. It's finished. We receive the benefit of that covenant. That's what drinking the blood means. And so when we receive His life, we are receiving a life which is free from sin, which has complete victory over sin, in which sin has been put away. And God says there is no remembrance of sin in the new covenant. You see it? And so we're living now in these last days. According to the chart that we had. So, I know someone will ask this, so I want to deal with it. Because the new covenant says, well, God says he will put his laws in our hearts and in our minds, right? Yes. And that sounds like the old covenant. Let me tell you something, just to help us understand. In the Old Covenant, God required His people to actually learn and memorize the law and put it in their mind and in their heart. You know that? He says, you shall speak of them when thy lies down, when thy rises up. These words shall be in thine heart. Isn't that right? That's in the Old Covenant. The new one is not like the old. So what is the difference? Because this is the thing. A lot of people think the New Covenant is simply a change of where the law is. We say the law used to be in the ark, in the old covenant. In the new covenant, the law is in the heart. And so we memorize the law and we help God to put it in our heart that way. That's not what the scripture is talking about. So what is it talking about? What is the law of the new covenant that is placed in the heart? Is it the same Torah of the old covenant? A lot of people will say yes. What does the Bible say? Here is what it says. Romans 8 and verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Pause and think about the words and what they mean. There is only one thing that makes free from sin and death. It's not the blood of bulls and goats, and it's definitely not the Torah. It's not the books of the Old Testament, all of them. There's only one thing in which sin or that accomplished the defeat and putting away of sin. And what is that? The life of Christ. Here Paul says, it's called the law of what? Of the spirit of life. Where is it? In Christ Jesus. Guess what? This is the law of the new covenant. You realize that? This is the Torah of the new covenant. Is it better? According to Hebrews it is. You better believe it. Because this is not just written as words in stone or on paper. This is actually the very life of the Son. Mm. That becomes your new law if you receive Christ. 
This is what you obey. This is what guides your existence. And in that life, sin has been put away. So when you receive it, you are only then made free from the law of sin and death. So liberty from the law of sin and death, brothers and sisters, is by the new covenant. It's by Christ. Do you see the picture? So it's a better covenant. A much better one. It has better promises. It's not a renewed covenant. In Christ's life, sin had no dominion. In those who receive the new covenant, sin has no dominion. Amen. That's salvation. You see, it's important to understand. When we receive salvation, brothers and sisters, salvation is not to be saved in our sins. Salvation, and in the new covenant, God says, I will not remember their sins. You know why? Because we are not reminding Him. Think about that. How was there a remembrance of sin in the old covenant? Every time the people sinned, they brought a sacrifice, and there was a remembrance of sin. In the new covenant, and in those who have the new covenant, there is no remembrance of sin. So here's the question. Are you reminding God of sin while still claiming to be in the new covenant? You with me? Is our action, our actions, our behavior, the condition of our mind and our heart, is it a reminder to God of sin while we are claiming to be in the new covenant? Because many times you actually think the new covenant is like the old. It's all about the doing. It's not about the being. But there is a vast difference. The new covenant is in his life. That's what marked the end of the world and the start of a new world. And in this new world, it's actually called by an, another name as well, which we will look at in a minute. But I don't want us to miss, to miss this particular point. The reason God says there is no remembrance of sin is because what he's looking at in these last days is the life of his son. And all those who have the life of his son. So when we receive the life of the son, it is to give us complete and utter victory over sin. If we continue to sin when we receive the life of the Son, we have a problem. We are putting a reminder for sin. Now here's the thing, I want to encourage you here, not discourage you. I know that even after we accept Christ and become Christians and born again, we stumble and fall and mess up and even, God forbid, sin. Isn't that right? If I was to ask for a show of hands, everybody would put their heads up. So I'm not going to. That's the reality of it. Why? Because many times, like Peter, we are not consistent in our faith and in beholding Christ. We forget. We turn away. We get distracted. Our faith wavers. We doubt and we stumble and we fall and we mess up. And guess what? God does not give up on us when we mess up. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And God has offered him. His sacrifice is sufficient to restore and recover us. But the key, brothers and sisters, is God does not want us to keep on falling. God wants us to have such a firm and consistent faith. Such a complete realization and reception of the life of Christ. That when he looks on us, he does not remember sin anymore. Why? Because it's been put away. Not by our effort in trying, but by allowing the life of Christ to exhibit and manifest what He accomplished. How is that possible? By staying your mind consistently on Him. By being so full of His presence. A constant and consistent realization of what you have will enable you to manifest what is His life. You with me? And so that when God looks upon you, He sees the life of His Son, and He doesn't keep remind, get reminded of sin. That's the key feature of the new covenant. That's what it means. We think this no remembrance of sin has to do maybe with something in the future that will happen, and I don't know what. Guess what? God wants to put away sin in the lives of His people today. Actually, from the end of the world, from the cross. That's the time when we have that life. Yes. Okay, what sin are we talking about? Yeah, when you say, when you continue to remind your sin. 
Okay. Reminder of sin. Okay, good question. Uh, what are we talking about when we talk about sin and what is this reminder of sin? The Bible talks about Christ as condemning sin in the flesh. He overcame every temptation. He never once gave in to sin because he was connected with God and he never lost that connection with God. The sin that manifests in our behavior and in our action that is contrary to the law is an indication of an inner heart problem. It's a manifestation of the life that we receive from Adam, which is separate from God. And so it comes short of the glory of God and manifests in these shortcomings and these behaviors. In Christ's life, there was a consistent and complete connection with God. And all he manifested was righteousness, an outflow of what he was and what he had. When we are born again, we receive the life that he had. We are connected with God, and therefore, what will manifest and flow out will be the same thing that Christ manifested. In other words, when temptation comes, and the, uh, the issue of sin and falling and committing sin comes, we have in us that which has overcome already, and what we manifest is victory over that sin. So the action and the behavior is a manifestation of what you already have from Christ. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so this is the key, and this is why in the New Covenant, when God looks at the New Covenant, He does not get reminded of sin. Look, let me put it to you this way. When God looks at the world, He gets a reminder of sin everywhere He looks. We get that, right? Everywhere we look, we see a reminder of sin. The only place where God is looking so that He does not get a reminder of sin is where? The New Covenant which is in the life of His Son, and in all those who possess the life of His Son. So this is my, my, why my question to you is this. Are you reminding God of sin, just like all the world is doing? Or are you living the life of the Son? That's a high calling, right? Amen. So if you've messed up, I'm not saying this to discourage you. I want to encourage you. Like Jesus lifted up Peter from the water and He says, Why did you doubt, O ye of little faith? Remember that? Mm -hmm. Seek Christ fully, yes. not try harder, not try and earnestly, you know, in your effort, try and overcome and put away sin. Seek a more full realization of the presence of Christ and His life and what it means. When we have an understanding of what we have in Christ, and look, if you don't fully realize it, ask and it shall be given. Is that right? You don't have to go climb a mountain and do it with some great effort or accomplishment. God says, ask, it shall be given. Seek and you will? Fine, but at least now you know what to seek for. That's the standard. Amen. The life of Christ. So, we're living in these last days. I guess that's a prophecy chart you never expected. Because it's not a prophecy chart. It's a gospel chart, right? <laughs> so, what's this new world called in closing here? Here it is from John. This is another perspective, just so we can appreciate it better. Luke 16 and verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. Another name for the new covenant is? The kingdom of God. This is not talking about heaven. This is talking about the kingdom of God that Christ came to establish with his own life and death. And with his ascension, he now bestows his life and he established a brand new kingdom. It's called the kingdom of God. To be a citizen in that kingdom, you receive the life of Christ. The boundaries for this kingdom is the life of Christ. If you have the life of Christ, you are in the kingdom. kingdom. If you don't have the life of Christ, you are still outside the kingdom. And in this kingdom, in the life of Christ, this is the new covenant. Sin has been put away. There is no remembrance of Sin. Brothers and sisters, this is what we have in Christ. This is victory over sin in a different way. Amen. Not the old covenant way of read the law and memorize it and make sure you remember it in every instance and make sure you apply it. That's not how sin is put away in the life of Christ. He did it and He gives us what He did. He doesn't require us to repeat what He did. There's a big difference. Can you see the difference? One is better than the other. I put it to you that many Christians today profess and claim to be in the new covenant while they're still living by the terms and dictates of the old covenant. 
That's why it's so clear in the epistle to the Hebrews that we are now in the last days. Something vastly different has happened. Actually, a lot of people don't believe things are vastly different. I talk to people a lot, you know, and people believe that things before and after the cross are pretty much more or less the same. What made the difference is perhaps people's faith or lack thereof. I have news for you. That's not what makes the difference. There are things, brothers and sisters, that came about as a result of the death of Christ that were not there before. One of them that we're focusing on today is the putting away of sin. Before, there was a remembrance continually of sin. We have no remembrance of sin now in the life of Christ. That had never happened before. Welcome to the new covenant. It's called good news for a reason. Welcome to the kingdom of God. You see, the problem is, we're waiting for the kingdom of God to come and for us to enter. And it's been here for 2,000 years. And we live and act like we're still waiting for it to arrive. Maybe we need to update our charts a little bit. You with me? The kingdom of God, many times, look at this verse, seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness. You know, most people think that's talking about heaven. You know, seek to make it to heaven first, make that your priority. That's not what it's talking about. It's all about this kingdom that Jesus came to establish, that John preached. It's here. It's been here for 2,000 years. In that kingdom, there is no sin. Welcome to the kingdom. And if you're struggling with sin, let me introduce you to the solution to sin. The life of the Son. Guess what, brothers and sisters? That's a real thing. That's not a metaphor. That's not a figure of speech. That's not an idiom to encourage you in your meager, faint efforts. That's a reality. That's a supernatural thing that God infuses into your being from His very own being. It's the very life of His Son. And in that life, sin has been defeated. Do you realize what you have? You know, if we did, we would live vastly different. The problem is, too often we forget. We take our eyes off Christ and we mess up and we are prone to think the good old way of the good old days. And off we go. And there is a continual remembrance of sin in our experience. Right? When it should not be. Because in this life, in these last days, in the new covenant, there is no remembrance of sin. So how are you living? How am I living? Is it a high calling? You better believe it. Is it possible? Jesus did it. That's the possibility. It's not whether you can do it or not. Jesus did it. How, how fully have you received it? And have I received it? So, John preached the kingdom, it says. Now, here's the thing. What does the preaching of the kingdom mean? It's a transition point here, according to this verse, right? Let me, let me read it again, just so we can pick up. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. John was the first prophet to ever preach the kingdom of God. True or false? Yeah. Yes, according to this verse. Up until that time, what was, pre what, what was working? The law and the prophets. Up until John. From the time of John, the kingdom of God is preached. Why? Because John was heralding the end of the world. And with the end of the world, the new one would come after. And so with the announcement of the new one coming, it says here, every man was pressing into the kingdom. People were eager to receive that kingdom. Didn't Jesus, well, John started preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus sent his disciples to preach the same message. And like we said the other day, that kingdom came with power in a public and visible and marked manner on the day of Pentecost. Thank you. That's when the kingdom was established. The, the thing is, and we looked at this briefly as well, John preached the kingdom. But John died before the kingdom came, before it was established. And that explains what Jesus means when he says that they that are born of women, there is no greater than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Because John preached the kingdom and that made him great, but he never lived to get in the kingdom. But the least one that gets into the kingdom is greater than John. So how do you get into the kingdom? By receiving the new covenant. 
receiving the life of Christ. What, what do I need to do to get it? That sounds great. I want it. By believing the reality of its existence and that God gives it to all those who believe as a gift. The problem is we don't realize the extent and value of the gift. What's really in that gift? We need to open it completely and understand the full extent of what's in the gift. Pressing into the kingdom of God is receiving the life of the Son. That's the new covenant, brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus brought us. And in his life is freedom from the law of sin and death. If you're struggling with sin, whatever sin it might be, whatever weakness it might be, whatever pet sin you might be cherishing or holding on to and struggling with and agonizing over and exerting a lot of effort to try and overcome, I want to point your eyes to another direction other than where you've been trying and failing. Look to the complete life of Christ and claim the victory that has been accomplished over that particular sin in the life of the Son. And God will work a supernatural miracle. Look, I hear so many testimonies. You might have a testimony like that. And when people are converted and they receive the new birth, I had a brother tell me this recently. And he says, something came upon him. He felt a certain energy or power in his being. And the addictions and things that had a hold on him were gone miraculously. Amen. You ever heard a story like that? Yeah. You ever maybe experienced that? That's the power of the life of the sun. So forget trying to go to some meeting and work up some program and try and exert some effort to try and break your addiction. God has given that victory in the life of the sun. The question is, how much do you realize? How much do you believe? How much do you claim? So I want to I want to encourage you to put your effort where there is going to be a result in seeking Christ more fully and realizing what you have and allowing that to manifest in the kingdom of God. There is no sin and there is no remembrance of sin. So here is how we would uh, summarize it. Jesus said, the law and the prophets were until John. From the time of John, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. This is the new covenant. This is the last days and it all commenced with the end of the world and the death of Christ. I know this puts a totally different perspective on the end times. I am well aware of that. We're talking about the gospel perspective. Amen. It's totally useless to know all the details of the charts and the prophecies and what will happen if you still have a remembrance of sin in your life. That's utterly useless. Amen. It's good, it's informative, but God, brothers and sisters, wants to transform our being. What really matters as far as God is concerned is this. Are you in the kingdom of His Son or not? That's the question that will decide your destiny. Doesn't Paul say, Apostle Paul say, God has translated us, He moved us from the darkness of this world into the kingdom of His dear Son. God has translated us, He's moved us. While we're living in this world, something happened, a supernatural thing happened. God established a kingdom and all those who accept His Son are transported into this kingdom that exists in this world, but this kingdom is free from sin. That's the new covenant. You know, some people think we're going to keep on sinning until Jesus comes. Or that Jesus saves us in our sins. You have no idea what the new covenant is if you believe that. The new covenant is where Jesus has overcome sin completely. Not just on His behalf, on our behalf. And He wants that victory to be manifested in the life of every citizen of that kingdom. Are you in that kingdom? Yeah. Don't just profess. Does your life demonstrate that you're in that kingdom. Because guess what? It's not your life. It's the life of the Son. How much you have. So, I want to ask it again because this is the point I want us to take away from this study. Are you reminding God of sin? Or have you been made free from sin by receiving the life of the Son fully? That's what living in the last days is all about. This is what the life of Christ is all about. <clears throat> Too often, we struggle with sin because what we're looking at is sin and trying to dodge sin 
and run from sin and hide from sin and we talk about sin and try and argue over defining sin and it seems like our Christian experience is just so full of sin no wonder we end up manifesting sin let's talk about Jesus more Let's talk about the solution more. Let's talk about righteousness. Let's contemplate the wonder of the life and the victory that he accomplished. You see, brothers and sisters, we don't escape sin by talking about sin, defining sin, and trying to dodge it. We escape it by looking at Jesus, Amen. by partaking of him, Re- putting away sin and, 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 uh, and overcoming sin is a byproduct of receiving Christ. Not as a result of you looking sin head on and taking it on and overcoming it. You know that's not possible. He did. So look to Christ. The Bible says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. Righteousness. So in other words, where are they looking? At righteousness. At Christ. They're hungering and thirsting for that. They're thinking of that. They're preoccupied with that. And all of a sudden you find that sin has no more room in your experience. You with me? This is victory over sin, kingdom style. (laughs) Isn't that right? It's the life of the Son. So how are you living in the kingdom? The Apostle Paul says the following, For sin shall shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. You know what he's talking about? You're not living over here. You're living now over here. Over there, before the cross, is the place where sin had dominion. That was the reign of sin. There was an ongoing reminder of sin. Since that time, the end of the world occurred and sin has been put away. So all those who are now under grace, sin has no more dominion of the, on them. You know you can claim that promise? You know that's a reality that has already occurred in the life of the Son? Claim it. I'm just hopefully encouraging you to put your focus and your effort somewhere where perhaps we don't usually put it on the life of the Son. Now some people hear this and I've had this and people say, look, what are you talking about? You know, it sounds a little bit, sounds a little bit airy-fairy really what you're talking about and it's just like magical thing. We read the Bible and we follow it. It's that simple. Yes, that's how it was back then. I am talking about something supernatural, brothers and sisters. And the way I like to explain it is the way Jesus explained it. When Nicodemus told him, how can these things be? And Jesus told him, you look at the wind and you don't know where it's coming from, but you see its effect. I can't define or describe to you the details of how God performs this miracle of taking the life of his son and infusing it into your being. And joining your spirit with the spirit of his son and making you one. But I can tell you that you can see the evidence and manifestation in the experience. It's a reality. And sadly, too many people deny it because they don't experience it. They don't seek after it. They seek the old way. Sin is the doing Here is an instruction book about all the good things I can do. Off we go. And sin continues to have dominion. Kingdom, covenant, and life is what Jesus brought us. Now, our time is up, but I have... I want to take just a couple of more minutes to bring this to a close in a really neat way, I believe, that will encourage us as well. Because... When we look at the last days, and we believe, like I said earlier, we believe in the end of, we're in the end of time. And when we look at a chart like this, we say, wow, it seems like the end now that we're waiting for on this side. Okay, we understand this is the end of the world. Well, when is the end of this last days? If these last days have been going for 2,000 years, well, they could keep going for God knows how long, Right? And it seems like it puts off the end of the last days. If if these last days are 2,000 years, well, when will they end? And that's a good question to ask. I want us to consider that as well. Uh, I should mention this here too. The the next part of our chart that will help us hopefully appreciate that is, uh, is looking at the before and after. The good and the better. Before the cross, that was the time of the law and being under the law. After the cross is being under grace, where Christ brought 
life. You see, the law was not able to give life. If there was such a law that could give life, the, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul says, surely righteousness would have been by that law. But there was no law that could give life. The only way that God could give life is in giving us His Son. And the life that He gives us is a life that is actually free from sin. So how long? Now, interestingly enough, there is a parable in, uh, in the Gospels that Jesus gave. And, uh, well, the parable is right there. Let's read it. The close of the parable, Luke 10, 35. It says, And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Remember what parable this was? Good Samaritan, right? Prodigal son is another one, but I know you meant the Good Samaritan. <laughs> Remember the Good Samaritan, the man who went down from Jerusalem, the robbers? Very significant parable. I don't want to spend this whole sermon in there, but I just want to pick highlights here. The Good Samaritan represents who? Christ. The man that was beaten and, and, and battered with sin represents us. And the Pharisee and the Levite passing by the man that didn't help him represent the law that cannot help us in our fallen condition. And along comes the Samaritan, Jesus, next of kin. And he takes us up and, and you know, he, he takes the man and, and fixes him up and, and, and takes him to the inn. And the inn here represents what? Okay, I'm getting silence and a few mumbles. I'll help you along, no problem. Represents the church, represents the kingdom of God. Exactly, thank you. The body of believers that nurture and sustain and encourage each other in Christ, awaiting till when He returns. Isn't that right? Yes. Now here's the interesting thing. The Samaritan, the good Samaritan, takes out of his pocket two pence and gives them to the host. Why two pence? First of all, I thank God it wasn't three pence. Because I just know that some Trinitarian somewhere is going to say, well, three pence, that's one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah, it's not, they, they would do that. You know, there's another verse in, in, in Revelation and Isaiah. The angels say what? Holy, holy, holy. So what did the Trinitarians say? Hey, one for the Father. One. Okay, so thank God it's not three pence. But there's a reason why it's two pence. You read in another parable the following. Matthew 20, verse 1 and 2. For the kingdom of heaven... By the way, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven is synonymous in the Bible. It's the same thing. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So a penny was the wage for how long? For a day. So he gave the host two pennies, which is the wages for how long? Two days. And he says, when I return again, I will repay you if you have any excess. And the implication is the two pennies should last you until I return. And the two pennies are two days. So if we look at our chart, and I want to superimpose on our chart here something that will hopefully put all this together and alert us to the urgency of the time, is I want to put the millennial week on our chart. And the millennial week is basically summarized as one day with the Lord is as a thousand, a thousand years. So each day of this millennial week is a thousand years. And quite quickly you find that in the first two days was the time before the giving of the law. That's one and two. The next two days is the time of the giving of the law and where the law reigned until you came to the end of the world, which occurred at which day? The fourth day on the millennial week. This is a millennial chart. You with me? Is everyone with me? Each day is a thousand years of human history. Christ came after 4,000 years and died, and there we see the end of the world. 
And now since that time we have been living in these last days. How long have we been living in these last days? For 2,000 years or how long? On this chart, for two days. How close are we to the end? The Good Samaritan gave the host two pennies. The wages for two days. You know what that means? We're at the very close of these last days. In this millennial week, after 6,000 years, comes the seventh day, which is the seventh millennium, or the Sabbath of rest, where everything will be wrapped up. Now, this is not news. This is familiar to us. The millennial week and after 6,000 years of history, even the Jews understood to some extent that concept. But brothers and sisters, we are living in the last days for 2,000 years, but we are at the very close of the last days because it's been two days or 2,000 years. You see the picture? So, how are you living in the kingdom of God? Are you preaching the kingdom of God or something else? You know that since the end of the world and in these last days, the number one message to be preached is the kingdom of God. Okay. It takes precedence over the law and the prophets. Because that's the reality of what the law and the prophets pointed forward to. So, we have the better covenant. Do you realize the reality of what that means? We have the life of Christ, which is free from sin. Do you realize and do you live in a way where there is no remembrance of sin in your experience because you are in that covenant? Brothers and sisters, I know this is a high calling. Amen. But Jesus has done it and this is what he wants us to be. He wants us to be an extension of himself. So that we no longer have a remembrance of sin in our experience. So, we're living in the last days. We're at the close of the last days. And with that, I want to close. And I'll ask you to join me in a word of prayer.